<laughs> Thank you and good evening, West Disbury. It's a pleasure to be back here, or at least I haven't been to this particular venue before. I've been to the Society before, but that was pre-COVID, where you were somewhere else. This is UFOs, Unidentified Flying Objects. And as you can perhaps see from the subtitle, I'm asking the question, are there any images that need an extraterrestrial explanation? So I'm not going to be discussing people's anecdotes. I'm not going to be discussing people claiming to have been inducted by aliens. I'm looking at images from the point of view of do these images imply an extraterrestrial origin or perhaps are there more down-to-earth explanations for the various images we're going to be looking at. So we can start with a survey carried out in America a little while ago. I ought to update this because this is now a little bit old. But a survey was carried out and people were asked, have extraterrestrial aliens visited Earth? And amongst the, the Americans, I think American students, bear in mind, amongst the people surveyed, the answer to that was yes. 40% said yes. If you ask a slightly different question, are extraterrestrial aliens visiting now, in other words, do aliens walk amongst us, you might think that number would be considerably lower. Well, it's lower, but only to the point of 35%. Now, this was Chapman University, 2018. I really need to update it if I can find something more recent, and I'd really like to know what the UK equivalent of these statistics are. Bear in mind that these numbers for extraterrestrials are less than the number who believe in ghosts, which is 60%, but greater than the number of people who believe in telekinesis and greater than the number of people who believe in Bigfoot. But no, the most shocking statistic is the last one. It's bigger than the one for evolution. So, amongst a certain group of Americans, I'm not saying all Americans, <laughs> clearly UFOs are big business. This is despite the fact that if you look at the number of cameras that people carry with them as a function of time, it of course was essentially zero if you go back a few decades. People did not walk around with cameras, or at least only a tiny fraction of people walked around with a camera in their pocket. But that statistic has gone from almost zero to almost 100% since the invention of the mobile phone that can have a little camera inside it. So you could argue now that everybody's got a camera all the time, that has now answered the question about flying saucers, about lake monsters, about ghosts, and about Bigfoot. However, despite the fact that you would argue that clearly if UFOs existed as extraterrestrials, we would know about it because we'd have lots of photos by now, clearly the issue is not resolved. No, it's not settled. Because if you Google UFO, you don't get just a few thousand web pages about UFOs. Last I checked, it was 250 million. Uh, and again, that hasn't been updated in a little while, so maybe it's a bit more than that now. So that implies that despite the fact that so many cameras are on people's persons all the time, and thus the opportunity for taking a picture of an alien bounding across a field is always there, the matter is not settled. So in this talk, I'm saying that UFO images could be one of a number of different things. They could be man-made objects that are being imaged or photographed or described. They could be natural objects. They could be artifacts. They only exist in the camera, not in the eye of the beholder. And they could be deliberately faked. And of course, the elephant in the room is, well, actually, there's a fifth possibility. And the fifth possibility is that they are actually extraterrestrial spacecraft, and we are indeed being visited. So I'm going to go through those in those uh, categories. Let's just get a few definitions out of the way first. I know UFO is a very old word. I'll form to the usual convention of a UFO is an object observed, usually in the sky, that is not readily identified. They're often observed at night, but not universally. Some are observed during the day. Um, the, uh, the buzzword now is not UFO, but uh, UAP, um, either unidentified aerial phenomena or unidentified anomalous phenomena, but I'm going to just stick to UFO because it's easier. And regarding an extraterrestrial origin, I side very firmly with Carl Sagan. Extraordinary claims require, require extraordinary evidence. So if anybody wants to claim 
that this particular image, this particular photograph is an extraterrestrial, they really need to have absolutely rock-solid evidence behind them. And a useful tool for any rational scientist is Occam's razor, which basically states that if there are two explanations that both explain a certain observation, a certain set of facts, then the explanation that requires the least speculation is generally the better one. In other words, given an option, a simpler solution is like, more likely to be correct than a more complicated one. If you've got a complex answer or a simple answer, that doesn't necessarily prove anything, but the simpler one is more likely to be correct. So we'll use that once or twice this evening. So where do you find reliable information about UFOs? Well, you can go lots of places, including America where you can find, you know, this guy is obviously going to be very useful. You can see him sitting on the porch there, the little green man. So clearly that information will be right from the horse's mouth. <laughs> I wondered how far back you can go. Obviously with imaging, you can, you can think about reports going back a long way, but with imaging, that's obviously got some finite start with photography. But I was quite interested to find that there was... Uh, data going back even before the advent of photographs. We would, of course, like our photographs to be like this. We would like the photographs of this UFO, this flying object. We would like the photographs to be clear, and we would like them to be detailed. We would like them to be in focus. We would like them to have no camera shake. In other words, the camera should have been quite steady when the picture was taken, not moving around all over the place. And it should have been correctly exposed but we virtually never, ever, ever find UFO images that are clear, well-focused, well-exposed, etc. Most UFOs, in terms of most images, fall into the category of a little white splodge. <laughs> they're blurred, they're out of focus, the camera has probably moved, making it almost impossible to tell whether the object has moved, and they're usually overexposed, quite often because they're taken at night and the camera wasn't correctly exposed for the object they were trying to expose for the night. Making it bigger doesn't help. You just get a bigger splodge. It really doesn't help. And you could argue that 99% of UFO images fall into this category by which you can tell absolutely nothing about what it is that was photographed. Not only because the image itself contains very little information, but also because there's no metadata using the modern slang. Metadata, the information relating to the picture. When was this taken? What date? By whom? Which way were they pointing? How high in the sky were they pointing? What was the exposure? What was the F number? What was the film that was used? Most of this information is lost to antiquity. By the time you've got a copy of a copy of a copy of the original photograph, you have got no idea of any of the related data that helps you understand the context is that just an object in the sky? Was it a helicopter? Well, without knowing any of the details about the date or the time or any of the photographic information about exposure and aperture, we just have no way of going back and saying, well, I think that might have been something rather than a flying saucer. And that's part of the problem. We'll come back to that point towards the end again. But in terms of the earliest, I thought, well, can we go before photographs, uh, hieroglyphs? I mean, look at that, top left, an Apache helicopter. I mean, good grief. <laughs> Next to that, uh, Luke, Luke Skywalker's uh, land speeder. Uh, below that, we have, a, we have a Zeppelin. So clearly, UFOs were chiseled into hieroglyphics. I looked at that, and I thought, well, that's been photoshopped, hasn't it? And then I realized, no, it hasn't been photoshopped. These are genuine hieroglyphics. I thought, that's interesting until I realized what the explanation was. And that is, it's two sets of hieroglyphics. Because Seti and Ramses II both wanted their hieroglyphs on this bit of stone. And just like you might take a uh, sheet of paper, if it's got pencil on it, you might rub it out and then draw over the top. Or if it's a canvas, you might paint over the top of another painting. Well, that's what they did. If this particular stone was in a nice position, one. Um, one of the uh, pharaohs simply chiseled his hieroglyphs over the top of the other and didn't do a particularly good job. When you realize there's two sets of hieroglyphs, if you color code them, you can see the Apache helicopter has gone, the land speeder has gone, and the Zeppelin has gone. So it's a bit of a shame, but there is a very simple explanation for what looks like some very interesting hieroglyphs. So let's have a look at a number of man-made objects that might conceivably be confused with UFOs. The US Air Force is trying to make life easy for us. So some people, <laughs> some
some people who live next to uh, a secret uh, US Army base or US Army or US Air Force base might see the occasional super secret aircraft coming into land or taking off. And the US military don't want you to know about that. So they've given you this very useful chart to help guide you through what it is you're looking at. The first one is a weather balloon. The second one is a weather balloon. The third one is a weather balloon. The fourth one is a weather balloon. The fifth one is a weather balloon. What's that? No, swamp gas. Uh, and then we've got a weather balloon, uh, a weather balloon, a weather balloon, a weather balloon, a weather balloon, and you can guess a weather balloon. So they're just trying to make it easy for you to make it clear that whatever you think you see a top secret spy plane that looks like a, a stealth fighter or something, no, it isn't. It's just you're just confusing it with something else. Okay, here's an image, and. I've said, is this uh, a long exposure of a, flute, of a fleet of uh, UFOs flying? There's uh, a little bit of stuff in the foreground. There's a tree branch here, and I think there's a leaf on the other side. But what do you think it is we're looking at there? What is this a photograph of? It seems reasonable. It's contrails. Would that be commercial aircraft or military aircraft? Commercial aircraft don't fly like that and military aircraft that might fly in formation don't fly in formation high enough to pull contrails. So neither, unfortunately, fits the bill. Laser light, that's an interesting guess, but uh, not in this uh, particular case. This image, I've deliberately misled you by telling you, or at least implying, that this is a long exposure. I've said long exposure, question mark. If it's a long exposure, you assume something is moving. Actually, it's a snapshot. It's not a long exposure. It's a picture. And it's a picture from Pylon of the Month, December 2019. <laughs> now, I'm sure this is one of your favorite web pages because you're all interested in electricity pylons, aren't you? And as soon as I put the electricity pylon into this picture, you can see exactly what it is you're looking at. It's a picture of a pylon taken on a misty day so that the pylon itself isn't actually visible. But ice has formed on the cables, and ice is reflecting some light, perhaps some light from a town over just the horizon there. As soon as you realize it's a snapshot, you change your mind as to, ah, well, it's obviously objects moving through the sky. Again, context. If you don't know the exposure, you don't know the aperture, you don't know when it was taken, you can be easily misled into thinking you're seeing something that isn't actually there. And Pylon of the Month, for anybody that wants to check it up, pylonofthemonth.org. It is a genuine, or was, I haven't checked recently, but it was a genuine web page where you can check lots of interesting pictures of pylons. And of course, uh, more recently, anybody who sees a jellyfish like that in the sky, who would not think UFO when you see one of these amazing things in the sky? Never seen them myself, but if you catch the launch of a rocket just uh, usually around sunset, so the rocket is, uh, is launching into the evening twilight, the sun can catch the, uh, the exhaust trail of the rocket and give you some spectacular sights. If you know that a rocket has just launched, it's no surprise that you can see these things. I don't think it's ever caught anybody out, though I think at the time people did report UFOs to the local police. Rocket trails that might start off quite straight because of the atmosphere moving with different winds at different heights. It can distort contrails, and in this case, the... the uh, I beg your pardon? Uh, this is just iridescence formed by the contrail. So in other words, the, uh, the rocket contrail leaves a whole load of aerosols, effectively unspent fuel in its wake, uh, and that can cause the iridescent colors at the top of the cloud there. But again, if you know a rocket has launched, then it's no surprise, and you wouldn't regard that as being a UFO. Again, if you saw objects like that without realizing what was happening, again, you might be forgiven to think this is the prelude to an invasion. This is simply a few scientists running amok, sending up some sounding rockets into the high atmosphere and releasing gases that fluoresce in the sunlight because the sun has only just set. And so various gases of different colors uh, um, are released at different altitudes. And then by watching what happens to these little pockets of gases, again, you can see how the upper atmosphere behaves. Useful for anybody who wants to understand different winds at different heights, and also quite useful for understanding auroral interactions as well, depending on how high these are. If the yeah, at the bottom there. Oh, sorry. Lasers don't work too well, do they? At the bottom there, yes. 
So if you know what's going on, it's all easily explicable. And again, if you go back a few decades, something like this would have cons been considered rather weird to see a lot of lights in the sky all dancing around. But of course, in the last few years, we've become so used to the idea of put a few lights on a few drones and send them up and have them fly around, that's now commonplace. But 20 years ago, this would have um, I presumably put dread into the hearts of various people who saw it. Of course, you know, we've seen it uh, fairly recently, and the control and the positioning of these drones is much better than it used to be, such that um, they are now precise to centimeters rather than a fraction of a meter, and so you can get, basically, artwork in the sky. I don't believe anybody's tried to make a flying saucer out of these drones in order to project that onto the sky. It'll happen sooner or later, I'm sure. Some people have said, yeah, but regardless of the actual UFOs themselves, I've seen the landing pads. Uh, I've flown over the Utah desert, and I've seen them. They're down there. There's three big landing pads down there. And they're in the middle of nowhere. Well, middle of nowhere, perhaps. But if you're flying from A to B, you can pretty much work out that if you saw them halfway through your flight, you can just look at a map and figure out, well, I must have been somewhere around here when I took that picture. And if you look on Google Earth, you find that, well, actually, they're not landing pads. They're just a, a solar array. It's a solar power station, effectively, a solar heating. Lots of mirrors um, arranged, all pointing to the central tower there, such that you end up with a very hot furnace where either you melt things at very high temperature or you use it for, uh, for generating power. So again, Google Earth simply gives you the explanation very quickly. And although I wasn't intending to spend too much time on videos, I got diverted onto videos despite starting by looking at different images. And of course, the internet is absolutely full of people who say, look, there's something interesting. There's a large cigar-shaped UFO floating over the lake. It's absolutely incredible. I've removed the soundtrack because it's an American and far too irritating. So, <laughs> so basically, this went on YouTube and has had a few zillion hits from people who say, yep, yeah, that's absolutely convincing. You know, There's no man-made object that can just float in the sky like that. Uh, despite the fact that the day after it was posted, Goodyear came along and said, sorry guys, no, that's us. Um, you know, there's a, there's a football stadium on the other side of the lake. Duh, you know. And oh, yep, yeah, the Goodyear blimp sits over football stadiums all the time. And despite the fact that Goodyear owned up and said, that's us, people still hit this YouTube webpage for weeks, months, probably years afterwards saying, yeah, that's pretty convincing, that is. Even though it was explained, almost immediately. And that's uh, another factor of life, I'm afraid. Even when things get explained, lots of people will jump on the conspiracy theory bandwagon. But whilst I, after I looked at that web, uh, that uh, particular video, I, I saw a link that said, finally, super clear footage of a UFO. I thought, at last, after all of these blurry images, at last, in daylight, somebody has got a super clear image of a UFO. Fantastic. So I had a look at the, uh, the YouTube video. <laughs> so, any idea what do you think it was? It looks a little bit like a reflection. It is definitely something caught in the sunlight. And after a while, at the end of a quite a long video, I realized this guy settled down a bit, pulled the zoom back a bit, and then you can see what it is. So James, or John, or Jennifer had a party, and uh, their Mylar balloon escaped. And it's quite obviously a Mylar balloon. It does look a bit odd, and I admit, Mylar balloons, because they are metallic and plastic, they can reflect light in rather odd ways. And if it just catches the sun right, you can get a very odd reflection. But in this case, with a huge zoom on this person's video camera, it was possible to catch what it actually is. So you could argue, it was, for a while, an unidentified flying object, but once you get to the end of the video, it's quite obviously identified. And as I say, I wasn't intending to look at video because there were far too vi many videos on YouTube and life is too short to go and watch them all. Um, but I did get interested in one particular claim of a, of a video. And they said, Puerto Rico is a hotbed of UFO activity. And there have been countless UFO sightings over the years. But this is what grabbed my attention. Many experts consider this next piece of footage the gold standard. 
This is it. Of all the YouTube videos that are out there that purport to show something odd in the sky, this is the one that experts say is the gold standard. Now, they don't name the experts, <laughs> but they say this is the one. This is the smoking gun. So I thought, well, if they consider this to be so damn good that this is irrefutable, perhaps I ought to have a look at it before I dismiss it, and then uh, I can dismiss all the others if we can deal with this one. So does this gold standard stand up to scrutiny? I was impressed by the fact that it came from the US Customs and Border Patrol. I figured that if anybody's got a decent camera, this is from, taken from an aircraft, if anybody's got a decent infrared camera, it's probably the US Customs and Border Patrol. They are continuously looking for immigrants coming across the border and for contraband of various kinds. So they probably have state-of-the-art infrared cameras. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if these cameras were sort of, you know, £100,000 or $100,000 or so. So I thought, well, if they've taken some images of a UFO, it's probably worth having a look at. And here is the UFO going hell for leather across the countryside of Puerto Rico. And it looks like, because we're zooming, we seem to have a little bit of difficulty zooming at full speed. Oh, that's a bit of a shame. It doesn't seem to be playing. It looks like we're getting only every nth. Let's see if I can start it again and see if it makes any difference. Seems to start OK but then it freezes. So I think it's a, just a bandwidth problem of getting to zoom and back. So this is supposed to be a video of an object, the uh, darkish object in the middle there, some cows in the background. So it's a dark object flying across the countryside, um, heading in, the, in a northwesterly direction. Um, and it flies over the countryside. It flies over an industrial estate. It flies over the airport. We might not get that far, depending on whether or not the video is dropping frames or just not playing properly. So, OK, maybe I need to uh, jump forward. So the, yeah, so we've got to, yep, so it's flying over, it's flying over, the, uh, flying over the airport there. But one thing I figured that was really useful about this is the amount of information that has not been cropped out. In some cases, you find UFO videos in which the rather important information is either missing or wasn't taken in the first place. But because this is a high-spec infrared camera, it has a couple of things I was interested in. Bottom left, it has the GPS coordinates of the aircraft. So we know exactly where the aircraft was, frame by frame by frame even though you haven't seen frame by frame by frame this evening. Frame by frame, we know exactly where the aircraft was. But almost, well, as useful is the bottom right, which is, what is the point on the ground where the camera was looking, the target? If it was a person, that would be, where is the person standing? So the target is the GPS coordinate of whatever the camera is looking at. So in other words, this is a fairly sophisticated system. It's a camera on an aircraft. The camera knows where it is because of the GPS of the aircraft. And the camera knows where it's pointing. And it knows the height of the aircraft. So you can calculate what is the GPS coordinate of where you're looking. And both of those coordinates are available for every frame. That is really, really useful. So along the way, the object moves in front of a field. And I think those objects are probably cows, because I can't think of any real animals that would be much smaller or much larger. So the object is probably smaller than a cow. Um, and black means warm and white means cold. And you can see some cars on the road there. And it's probably as warm as a cow or possibly as warm as the, uh, as the bonnet of a, of a car. So we can tell from individual frames that it's not that big, but it's still reasonably warm. But because we've got the coordinates, we can actually analyze it and say what's actually going on. So I took uh, this, by the way, is the scale here, about one kilometer. This is the uh, airport. Uh, what is it? The Rafael Hernandez Airport on, uh, on Puerto Rico. Let me just uh, dim that down a bit so we don't get confused by all the, the background. I took the GPS coordinates and plotted them out. Not every frame. I took every tenth or every Every few seconds, I took a frame and worked out where that particular GPS location is. So the blue is the target, where the camera was looking. 
And a lot of people have commented, hey, look at that, the UFO is flying to the northwest. But the wind was coming out of the northwest. The wind was blowing towards the, sorry, the northeast, it was blowing towards the southwest. So there was a moderate d breeze blowing in the direction indicated, and yet the UFO is flying in the opposite direction. This is impossible. Objects can't do that unless they're powered by some mysterious propulsion system. <laughs> what was the aircraft doing at the same time that the UFO was doing this particular track? Well, I plotted the aircraft position over the same. This is about half of the video. And because we know every frame, we know where the aircraft is and where the UFO apparently is, we can draw a line between the two. And we can say, well, OK, from that particular point, I've just chosen the third point, doesn't matter, the UFO appeared to be somewhere on that line because the blue dot is where it would appear on the ground if it was sitting on the ground. And we can do that for various points. And we can say, well, a little bit later, it appears to be there. And later, it appears to be there. And later, it appears to be there. And later, it appears to be. What do you notice? It is entirely consistent with the fact that this is an object which is just sitting where the black dot is. The object appears to be going hell for leather to the left because the aircraft is going hell for leather to the right. It is a perfectly natural way that things react. If you've got a static object and you move, of course the background appears to move behind the object. And as far as I can tell, all of the footage is entirely consistent not with an object moving at 100 miles an hour across the ground, heading off towards the sea, but it's entirely consistent with an object that is just floating where the black dot is. I checked it a little bit later. I continued the red dots further and further around. The aircraft continued to fly quite a distance to the south. It's amazing how long this particular object was visible. Even when the aircraft was tens of miles away, could still see this object with their fantastic infrared camera. When it was way down here, I found that the black dot wasn't quite in the same position. The black dot, after a few minutes, appeared to have moved ever so slightly that way. Remember which way the wind's blowing? OK, entirely consistent with the fact that an object is just floating there, perhaps drifting downwind. So what did they say on YouTube? They say, of countless UFO sightings, many experts consider this to be the gold standard, without specifying who the experts were. They said that this clearly shows a metallic orb. Uh, well, OK. Moving at incredible speed, with no obvious propulsion into an 18 mile an hour headwind. The infrared camera sees an object that does not match anything we know of. That's a hell of a statement, isn't it? Metallic orb. How can you tell it's a metallic orb? It's a little smudge. No matter how good that camera was, we think it's smaller than a cow. We can't tell if it's spherical. It's not necessarily an orb, and you can't tell that it's metallic. So that's just a guess. Moving at incredible speed. Well, no. You can assume it's moving in at incredible speed if you wish, but there are alternative explanations. With no obvious propulsion. Well, true, there don't seem to be any engines. There's no nacelles. It's not the little Starship Enterprise. It seems to be just a featureless blob with no obvious engine inside it. And it's... Yeah. And it seems to be moving into an 18, 18 mile an hour headwind. Well, no, it isn't. And I don't know where you come up with a statement that it doesn't match anything we know of. So Occam's razor is, well, that might be an explanation which fits the facts, correct. But there's another explanation that fits the facts, and that is that the object that the, these guys were tracking is essentially static. If anything, it's drifting ever so slightly downwind. I think it's a balloon. So... Occam's razor, which do you think is the more likely? That it's a metallic orb moving at incredible speed with no obvious propulsion into a headwind, or it's a balloon that happens to be floating just, uh, just a little bit next to the, uh, to the airport? Why is it moving, though? Most things are warm in the sunshine. Oh, sorry, um, this was taken, I can't remember what time it was, but if it was floating around in the day, it would have warmed up. Even if it was taken at night, it would still be a warm object. Like those mylar objects, they'll get warm, like those mylar balloons. So if it is a balloon, this idea of no obvious propulsion, well, that goes away because there is an obvious propulsion now. The obvious propulsion is it just floating in the breeze. Therefore, none of those points actually bear scrutiny. And this is the gold standard. This is the one that is the absolute smoking gun 
cannot possibly be refuted. All the other videos on YouTube are worse than this in the sense that they are making claims. They are making claims that simply they cannot back up. They are making statements which are not derived from the information in front of them. And had their expert bothered to look at the GPS coordinates and done the same thing I had done, they should have come to the same conclusion, but they didn't. UFOs might be, other than man-made objects, they might be natural objects. And instead of pylon of the month, which is clearly man-made, we can go to cloud of the month. I'm not sure if you've seen this one. The Cloud Appreciation Society does have a cloud of the month. And they have some uh, beautiful objects, some lenticular cloud, something that looks like it really belongs in the opening sequence of Independence Day there. Um, and some that look like they've just had a hole punched in them by a a circular spacecraft descending through the cloud base. That one in the top right is rather curious, the fact that it appears to be a circle of uh, little bits coming out of the cloud. It's actually a half circle because it's, I think, the end of a, a racetrack. An aircraft is doing a, 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 it's in a sort of a standing pattern. It's been told to circle for a while before coming into a local airport. And the aircraft is probably just inside the cloud but it's disturbing the cloud enough to give that rather odd effect as it uh, circles round. So there's plenty of clouds that, uh, that produce some rather dramatic results. The lenticular clouds um, uh, can be quite spectacular. Even though that is amazingly spectacular, it doesn't stop people going into Photoshop and making it even more spectacular. <laughs> so you do have to be careful about what you see um, in images as well as what you see in videos. But that, again, looks rather odd. You think, well, is something going on on the other side of those houses? Are there loads of floodlights that are pointing up to the sky? Well, there's nothing unusual about what's on the other side of those rooftops. What's unusual is what's in the air. What's in the air are lots of ice crystals that are relatively flat, and so they're behaving like mirrors. So all they're doing is reflecting street lights of um, a local town. And the fact that you get a column on top of every street light is a result of the fact that you've effectively got a little mirror up there because the, uh, the little ice crystals prefer to stay horizontal depending on the temperature and the pressure conditions and the, uh, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. So the ice crystals will often stay horizontal and act like mirrors uh, reflecting the, uh, the street lights in the distance. Yeah, it certainly gives that impression. And depending on the distance you are and depending how high, the, how high the ice layers are, you can get some wonderful effects. In this case, the different colors are purely from the fact that the different street lights in the, difference are, in the distance are different colors. So some appear to be slightly blue, some appear to be slightly golden. But you can get spectacular results if the ice crystals happen to be high in the sky. You really do get this city in the sky sort of uh, feeling by looking at something which is a, almost a mirror image of whatever it is. Sometimes it's reflecting light that's actually partly over your horizon. So even if you can't see lights on the horizon, you might still see lights in the sky if you get the, uh, the conditions right. The ice crystals don't necessarily stay the same at different elevations. In some cases, the ice crystals actually vary. And in this case, the ice crystals are starting to get unstable as you go higher and higher. And hence, these light pillars seem to sort of branch out in the opposite sense to a sort of a root system for these trees. You, you, you can see these in cold countries, in Alaska, in Scandinavia. Uh, even this one uh, was taken from um, from the mid-states of America. So it can happen if you get the right cold conditions in, in the middle of winter, you can get these ice pillars or light pillars to show up. Here somebody is looking into a cloud, so there's a, two houses on both sides, but they're looking up into the cloud and something appears to be jumping around in there and something appears to be jumping extremely fast. Whether or not it's a spacecraft that's parked in the cloud and is just jumping back and forth, given that this cloud is probably a few miles up, if you calculate how fast things are moving, you get some rather incredible speeds for the things jumping around inside the cloud. And so you can start to ask, well, what is it that can possibly move that fast inside a cloud, given that clouds are, generally speaking, full of water and very little else? OK, maybe ice as well. And that is partly the explanation here. This is a thundercloud. 
and so it's almost certainly electrically charged and ice crystals again might reflect light in different directions and they will tend to orient themselves horizontal in the absence of an electric field but if they're in a thunder cloud then the electric field in the cloud will orient the little ice crystals and they all behave like tiny little mirrors if you have a lightning strike the charge in the cloud suddenly changes the lightning strike doesn't need to be visible here the lightning strike can be half a mile away or a couple of miles away it changes the charge inside the cloud which means all of these little mirrors suddenly reorient themselves nothing is actually moving backwards and forwards but lots of tiny mirrors are just readjusting themselves and because they're only a tiny tiny fraction of a millimeter in size they can easily move in a fraction of a second so the illusion of something apparently moving bodily backwards and forwards is an illusion caused by the fact that lots of tiny mirrors are reorienting themselves in the electric field of a cloud these are amazing things, red sprites. Until relatively recently, some people didn't even believe they existed because some people might have said, I've seen lots of these funny-looking things hovering above clouds. And plenty of people would say, well, there's no such thing. You know, we know about lightning coming down from clouds, but you don't get sort of lightning above clouds. You can't get lightning strikes above clouds. But these red sprites were imaged and in the last 10 or 20 years they got much much better at imaging this picture implies that it's a very bright uh, spectacle which you would assume lots of people should be able to see it's a little bit of an illusion because they're not that bright and they are very fleeting they f like a lightning strike it only usually occurs for a fraction of a second but I noticed the astronomy picture of the day, there's one from 2017, but a more recent one actually showed them in amazing detail. And you look at that, and who would not think that's a UFO? Who would not think that's an alien invasion? I don't understand what's going on in there, and I don't think the scientists who are studying these do yet. There's something that looks a little bit like fork lightning at the bottom, but why do these fork lightnings then connect with these rather fuzzy-looking cones at the top? This is an area of atmospheric research where people really do not understand what's going on. These things are really high. They're high in the atmosphere, so they're not particularly close, so it makes, it, makes studying them more difficult, and they generally only occur above rather energetic thunderstorms. So you have to have the right conditions below them in order to generate the sprites, and you have to have the right camera gear in order to catch them. But if it's possible to catch images like that, you do start to wonder, well, how on earth did we miss this? How, how was it that last century we didn't even know this stuff existed? And now it's a thriving area of atmospheric research. For an astronomical society, this one should be easy. A report of an arc-shaped UFO over Ontario. The text was, well, I was, it was near the end of the day and I sat down on my deck facing west. Something caught my eye, brilliant white. Okay, brilliant white in the evening, west. What do you think it is? <laughs> Sharp. In truth, I cannot be sure what it truly is. My conclusion, a UFO. There you go, a knee-jerk reaction. If you don't know what it is, it must be a UFO. Now, according to the strict definition of UFO, maybe that's the case, but is it really flying? Or is it just an object in the sky? My friend thinks the object is as big as two airliners. This is common in UFO reports that people gauge the size of something. Even though they've got no idea how far away the object is, they still try and say it's this big. They don't say it's the size of your thumb. They don't say you can cover it with your little finger. They don't say it's two degrees of sky. They say it's the size of a bus, the size of a giraffe, the size of an airliner or in this case, the size of two airliners. Now, okay, this person's friend might have been wrong. I thought one airliner, but maybe he's right. So you can argue as to whether this particular object was one airliner or two airliners, but it was, of course, Venus. Yes, if you see a bright light in the sky in the west uh, around sunset, even before sunset in some cases, or after sunset, and if your zoom lens of your camera shows it as a small arc or crescent, then yes, it is quite definitely the planet Venus. Okay, so we've looked at man-made objects, we've looked at natural objects. Sometimes UFOs are image artifacts. 
You can tell this is the case whenever, whenever somebody posts something on the internet and says, I took this picture. I didn't see anything at the time, but now I look at the picture, I see something odd in the background. If you didn't see it at the time, it's very unlikely that it's actually there. It's almost certainly an artifact of the image. This goes back, uh, what, 70 or so years. This early picture of mysterious lights in the sky over the capital. Were they invading Washington? We seem to have lots of little TIE fighters in the background there, a little swarm of them sweeping past the capital. Well, that's one explanation. Alternatively, you look at what's going on at the bottom. You turn it upside down and you translate it to the top. And what do you find? One, two, two, one, 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 etc. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between those little dots in the sky and each of the lights in the foreground. It is simply a reflection. No camera lens, even modern camera lenses, do not get rid of reflections completely. If you go back 50 years, reflections were an absolute pain. These days, multi-coating a lens will reduce the amount of reflection inside a camera, but if the source of light is bright enough, you will still get a reflection and you will still get artifacts in your image. This particular object, I had to laugh when I read the description of this one. This is clearly a UFO. It's a large spacecraft. The large craft came so close to the photographer that the windows can even be seen in the image. I don't know what the windows are. I'm guessing they mean that, uh, with the pilot sort of waving through the open window. The UFO sighting is 100% proof that aliens are here on Earth. Must be true because aliens are in capitals. So <laughs> it's aliens, not just aliens, it's aliens with capitals. You look at that and you think, well, what on earth were they doing? But then, if you, do, if you dig a little deeper, you find that that's actually a small prop from a much bigger image. And the original image was taking a picture of, I assume, the moon. Given that everything else is dark, I assume this is the moon rather than the sun. And they have pointed it at probably the full moon, taken a picture, and the bright moon is way, way, way overexposed. And there's a horrible reflection, probably because it's a very low quality lens. Again, I've got no idea which year this was taken. Just because it appears on the internet in 2020 doesn't mean it was taken in 2020. This could be a 50-year-old image for all we know. And so whenever you have a bright object in the field of view, you are almost certainly going to get a reflection of some kind. And it sometimes looks like just a copy of the light source, and sometimes it's a very distorted copy of the light source. This one was a genuine picture taken by somebody who wanted to know what it is they had photographed. They took a picture of this lamp and they said, what's this, um, this UFO with, a, with an aura around it in the picture? What's that in the sky? It seems to have an aura around it. Is it a UFO? This was posted, I think, on Twitter. Um, they were genuinely wanting to know what it was because they said, hashtag UFO followed by hashtag serious question. Um, they, they did genuinely not think it was a UFO, but just wanted to know what, they, what other people thought it was. Again, although, yes, it seems to have a little aura around it, if you look at what that object is, let's blow it up so you can see it more clearly. What's the main source of light in this image? It's the sun peeking past a vertical wall. The sun is a disk. If part of it is peeking out from behind a wall, it's going to be a disk cut off on one side. And the sun is shining through the filigree work of the lamp stand, which is why you get the filigree work coming through. It's the wrong way up, because here the sun is on the left and the wall is on the right. Reflections, generally speaking, are upside down. Therefore, it's the other way up. So that is pretty much exactly what you would expect to see if you take a picture shooting into the sun. You are almost bound to get a reflection. The reflection, if you're lucky, isn't in the picture. The reflection might be just outside the field of view of the camera. But depending on exactly where you have the camera pointed, you're almost certainly going to get, when you take something as bright as the sun and you're pointing into the sun, you're going to get something like that. So no surprise whatsoever. You should be able to see them in the viewfinder, yes. yes. So you won't see them when you look at the object, but as soon as you bring the camera to your eye, you, you should realize that you're then seeing something like that, yes. That uh, people tend to ignore that sort of thing. Here's a picture 
from the looks of it, taken at night, from the looks of it, from the raindrops here, I think taken through the windshield of a car or a van. And there's a big rectangular slab floating in the sky. A big, flat, rectangular aircraft with lights all the way around the edge, hovering in the sky in front of the, in front of the uh, car. UFO enthusiasts and conspiracy theorists have claimed it's an advanced type of spy craft known as the TR-3B. Give it a few letters and numbers, you can convince people of anything. Give, saying it's a TR-3B really doesn't help. So you could say either it's a large rectangular slab floating in the sky, or you say, well, it was taken at night and it was taken through a windshield, and um, I think maybe somebody had their phone sitting on the dash, yeah. and they're looking at a reflection of a phone with a slightly bright edge, a metallic edge to it, etc. So again, Occam's razor, a big slab floating in the sky or somebody's phone sitting on the dashboard. <laughs> yep. Okay, so we've had man-made, we've had natural, we've had don't exist at all because they're only in the camera. Unfortunately, there are plenty of examples where people are simply faking images because they want people to click on their YouTube videos or their images uh, because they'll get some uh, clicks and they'll get some advertising. If, if ever you see a picture where somebody has to point at the object so you know what it is you're supposed to be looking at, you know that's, you know that's a fake. And anything that is just too good to be true is probably just too good to be true. So if a large object, something like Independence Day, did come and float in front of a city, in front of what looks like thousands of motorists, I think we would have heard about that. So uh, I don't think that's something you can easily keep quiet. But if you go back, um, this is one of the earliest I found that you can actually say something about it. This is back from 1966. Part of the problem, of course, is it, unless you really do your research well, you don't ever find the original photo. You find a copy of a copy. It, sometimes you even find just a, a copy of something that's come out of a newspaper where, of course, the reproduction of the newspaper not, might not be good. But regardless of the poor reproduction, it's still fairly clear that this is a fake because if you look at the uh, UFOs and you compare that with something else in the picture, in this case, uh, I, I'm not sure that's a telegraph line or a power line. Um, difficult to tell. It the overhead tram lines? I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. So there, the lines here, if you look at the detail, you find that the lines themselves are relatively sharp, about as well defined as they possibly can be. In other words, the person taking this picture appears to have either focused on infinity or, in, or focused on the post and the lines here. And yet, the object in the background is a lot fuzzier. If it was moving, it would be fuzzy in one direction. This has simply been blurred by the person who's superposed those on the image to make it look like there's objects in the sky. But if they were genuine objects in the sky, they would be sharper than that. Unless you actually believe that UFOs do not have sharp edges, that they are slightly spongy uh, and, uh, <laughs> and don't have an edge. Or they somehow affect cameras in the sense that they make the cameras come out blurred. This is the opposite problem. I took this uh, from a shocking new footage of alien ship over Chicago. Best UFO sighting of 2015 by the looks of it. You can't see anything there because it's so, bar so dark. So um, I uh, processed it to bring it out a little more clearly. This mottling in the background is exactly what you'd expect for any image in which you are close to the limit of how much information you are recording. It's basically noise, and it's a, partly a, a, a result of the way images are compressed before they're saved onto either uh, SD cards or video. And in this particular case, this triangular spacecraft Notice that the, we've got the mottling in the background, which is perfectly understandable, and yet the edges of this particular object are razor sharp by comparison. If that was genuinely in the sky, it would have an edge which was as mottled or as rough as what you see in the background there. So in this case, it's the opposite problem. The, op the previous slide, the person who superposed these um, UFO flying saucers blurred them too much. In this case, they haven't blurred it enough. They've made it really sharp, uh, much too sharp to explain from the background. Can I just ask you about this? Yes? Is it an objective focus of your end? Very unlikely that if you're focusing on something a long way away, that you're not also focusing on infinity. 
the depth of focus would have to be so ridiculously narrow to focus on something 20 meters away, but not something 50 meters away, not with a wide angle lens, no. The, 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 the hyperfocal distance, the distance at which you get infinity in focus would be relatively close. So absolutely infinity would still be in focus in that case. It might be that's the impression they were trying to give, but I don't think you'll ever see a photograph. The other way around might be convincing. If the UFOs were sharp and the tram, li uh, the tram um, lines, the power lines were slightly blurred, you might say they focused on a more distant object, but not that way around. Here we see a couple of UFOs buzzing Air Force One, allegedly. But um, I think this is uh, not correct for a number of reasons. Clearly, it's in the distance. It's quite some distance away. Let's face it, nobody gets very close to Air Force One. You can tell it's a long way away because there's a lot of light scattering. There's a, probably a few miles of air between you and Air Force One. And so the underside is not black. It's uh, sort of slightly blue or slightly gray because there's an awful lot of scattering of light from the intervening atmosphere. And if these objects are following Air Force One, there should be the same amount of um, scattered light for those as well. And yet they seem to be very high contrast, very dark objects compared to the underside of Air Force One. You could say, ah, well, the, uh, the, the little UFOs, they are really, really, really black. Well, maybe they are. But still, you would get scattering of light from the water molecules between you and those objects. And you wouldn't expect them to be significantly different in contrast to what you're looking at with Air Force One. So here, somebody has superposed two objects and not quite got the contrast right. Here we see a triangular, what's this with triangles all of a sudden? Here we see a triangular UFO sitting on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. There's a helicopter on the right, there's a, an F-18 jet sitting on the, uh, in the middle of the aircraft carrier, and apparently a few people up here discussing this UFO. I looked at this and thought, that doesn't look quite right, but can I actually show that this has actually been tampered with, as opposed to just saying it doesn't look right? So I looked at how bright pixels were in the image. Again, this is my background. My research is in processing images and analyzing images. So I simply had a look at the brightness of pixels in a little bit of gray alongside the F-18 jet. And even if it looks like they're all, roughly speaking, the same shade of gray, there will be brightness variations. There will be natural noise partly because of the conditions under which they're taken and partly under the fact that we're producing a, a JPEG image which involves a little bit of compression and there will always be some variation. So the brightness scale here, it doesn't really matter what the brightness scale is, it's about 70 units of brightness and it varies a little bit as we move along in pixels alongside the F-18 jet. That's exactly what we would expect for a perfectly normal bit of the image. But I did the same for gray pixels up here next to the UFO. And I found that you get a perfectly reasonable variation and then boom, same, 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 and then a little bit of variation. There is no natural way that that can occur. If you take an image, there will always be a little bit of variation. To have, I don't know how many, 20 or 30 pixels, all exactly the same intensity, in that particular range, that tells me that somebody has taken a graphics software, placed a artificial uh, UFO in position, and then done a little bit of tidying up by smoothing the pixels, and they've smoothed it to the point where they've all ended up all the same value. That is totally unnatural, and that is proof that that particular vid uh, image has been tampered with. So, no surprise. Uh, because looking at it, that might be what you guess in the first place. This is actually a still from a video where somebody was photographing outside their window uh, across the wing of the aircraft, and then some UFO flew in the opposite direction very quickly in a few frames of the video. So I grabbed one of the frames of the video, blew it up, and I thought, that looks vaguely familiar. I'm not much of a gamer myself, but uh, I have a nephew who's uh, very much into Halo and other games, and yes, <laughs> it is definitely from a, yep, yeah, 
It is definitely uh, taken from the CGI of various things that are available on the internet, and you can either produce 3D models yourself or uh, basically just cut and paste an image and put it into the video. So that doesn't need an awful lot of skill to do that. And that's part of the problem. CGI these days, computer-generated imagery, is so good, it's getting more and more difficult. The, the one I showed you of the triangular um, UFO sitting on the deck of an aircraft carrier, that was easy to show it was fake. But these days, if you're looking at imagery, it's getting more and more difficult. Let's face it, years ago, it was difficult to tell that Jurassic Park had fake dinosaurs. They looked so realistic. And now the, uh, the computing power available to the people who want to produce fake images or fake videos is getting just too good to the point where you can never be absolutely sure. So the fifth category, if it's not man-made, if it's not natural, if it's not an image artifact and it's not fakery, it could be extraterrestrial. And somebody's gone to the bother of uh, cataloging them all, which is very nice of them. So this is a, a number of different UFO sightings. I like this for a couple of reasons. One is because, perhaps you can't read it, based on actual sightings. So this is somebody who's collated lots of different um, descriptions of uh, spacecraft. Exactly what the difference is between one type and another. Well, you know, Some of these are subtly very slightly different from each other. So they've done a good job in cataloging all 80 of them. But bear in mind, this is 80 different models based on actual sightings of UFOs. But notice this is UFO sightings, set one. So there's more. <laughs> I, I just couldn't find set two, so maybe there's 160 of them. So there are plenty of people who are convinced that these things uh, definitely have visited us and are visiting us as we speak. Recently, NASA published its report. This came out a few months back. So I wrote this UFO talk a few years ago, and I was interested to see what NASA said. Interestingly, they quote, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So they're on the side of Carl Sagan as well. Great stuff. They also made the point that metadata, the data that tells you about the photograph you're looking at, is often absent, making a thorough understanding of context difficult. In other words, if you don't know what you're looking at, it's very difficult to say if it's real or not. If all you've got is a white splodge on a black background and you've got no idea of time, date, or anything else, it's very difficult to say. And their conclusion was there's no conclusive evidence suggesting an extraterrestrial origin for UAPs, as UFOs are now called, unidentified anomalous phenomena. NASA spent a few million pounds on this study. If they'd come to me in the first place, I could have told them all this. Yeah. But of course, then, then you have a little bit of a problem. Well, it might not be a problem, but if you've heard of the, the Fermi paradox, you say if there's a lack of evidence of UFOs, there's a lack of evidence of UFOs being extraterrestrial in origin, if you argue that, well, the number of stars in the Milky Way is 300 billion, and we now have got a pretty good idea of how many planetary systems exist. A few decades ago, we didn't really know, but now we know how many planetary systems exist in the Milky Way. And also, we have a pretty damn good idea of how many planets Earth-like. 20 years ago, we just had to guess. Now we've got a number. So we know the number of Earth-like planets in the Milky Way. Now, unfortunately, we do not know the likelihood of life arising. It might be that life has arisen on Europa or Enceladus. Maybe life existed on early Mars, but is not there now. So we don't know. But if we said, let's assume that 99% of the time, even if we have an Earth-like planet, let's assume 99% of the time life doesn't arise, then we can cut it down by a factor of 100. And what's the likelihood of that becoming complex life? Let's assume that 99% of the time it doesn't develop into complex life. We reduce it again. What about intelligent life? Let's assume 99% of the time that complex life does not in develop into intelligent life. Divide by 100 again. Even if you take the 1% of 1% of 1%, even if you take the 1 in a million view, you still end up with 50,000 civilizations. So where are they? The answer is perhaps they don't last long enough to be visible. Maybe they are out there, but they don't last for thousands or millions of years, and therefore we're not likely to contact them, perhaps. But remember the pale blue 
dot. As Carl Sagan said, look again at that dot, that's here, that's home, that's us. On it, every human being, whoever was, lived out their lives on a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. It's a reminder that the only life we know is terrestrial life, and we have no understanding whatsoever of extraterrestrial life. So even though the UFOs that everybody has photographed or videoed, they are not evidence of extraterrestrial spacecraft, they are not evidence of visitation. But more unsettling that the idea, for me, it's more unsettling to think about not that we might have been visited, but the fact that we might be alone. Thank you for listening.